everyone and welcome. You're listening to the TSE Talks, the place to be to learn more and explore the life in Magenta. I'm your host, Ume Mabuswab, and this is the second part of the Emotional Intelligence Talk with Leonardo Borelli from T-Systems and Matthew Strauss from Argo. If you didn't listen to the first part yet, I recommend you start there and then come back here to continue the discussion with us. So stick around. In the first part of our emotional intelligence episode, we talked about how this skill is not only helpful for managing relationships and collaborating better, but also amazing for reducing stress, getting more self-confident, more resilient and more present in the moment. The second and last part is focusing on how emotional intelligence affects mental health, operational excellence and how we can utilize it to motivate and inspire ourselves and the next generations. So without further ado, let's get started. Our guests for this second part are still Leonardo Borelli and Matthew Strauss. Leo is a business analyst and software designer at T-System in Barcelona with a passion for emotional intelligence. And Matthew is a partner at Argo Performance and Development in Vienna, Austria. He specializes in operational excellence and continuous improvement and has a very strong background in emotional intelligence. What does it mean, emotional intelligence? Let's look at that in the terms of mental health and how does it really help us? Because lately with the pandemic, we've finally been talking about mental health, thank God. And, and now that the pandemic is going away and then we're going back to normal, it feels that we started forgetting about mental health and it feels like it was just a separate thing. But it is t together, right? Because now that we're talking about emotional intelligence, you mentioned so many things that are really part of mental health and, and all of the well-being of, of um, the employees, but it seems like we still separate them. Are they separate things? Um, no, they're not separate things, but I would like to um, stress one thing at the very beginning. There's a lot of discussion now that programs like Search Inside Yourself or emotional intelligence programs or mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, which companies are offering, there is some rightful criticism that these companies are offering these programs as a panacea without making fundamental changes in the way we run our companies so that we're trying to give people tools to manage stress rather than changing sometimes very critically the processes which are causing those stress. So it's not an answer for everything. Mm -hmm. But in addition to making changes which are needed in our workforce, like in diversity and in the quality of our leadership and in, you know, how we approach um, workload and things like this and how we manage hybrid and working from home. Clearly, no matter what we do, because we're in a competitive business, there's always going to be stress. And because we're in a, in a very chaotic world, whether it's Corona or the situation in the Ukraine, we're constantly faced with competitive pressures, global economic pressures, and things like this. And we want people, if we want our people to bring their best um, and actually flourish in the environments, our work environments, yes, these same emotional intelligence, the ability to develop this goes hand in hand with developing resilience, which is critical. I mean, we talked about psychological safety within a team. This also generates beginning, as you said earlier, humility, as well as compassion, as well as confidence. They all kind of go together, gives you this resilience. Because you're going to fail. In this world, you're going to fail repeatedly. It's almost like psychological safety for yourself. It's not because with these practices, with this learning to see clearly and understand how the mind works and seeing how emotions and learning to let go of them, it allows us to be much more present rather than worrying endlessly about the future or regretting endlessly things we've done in the past, which massively harms our quality of life, um, it allows us to be much more focused on what can I control and wisely accept a lot 
almost there is a lot not in our control. And to get comfortable with that and to, to see that. And by the way, that includes your own emotions and your own thoughts are things that are not in your control. And you mm-hmm. become more relaxed with that reality, which you can imagine is very helpful for being flexible and responsive to the things you can control. Does that make sense? Yeah. Exactly. Fully agree. I could, I could add that there are a lot of studies that uh, demonstrate that um, the mental training for, for example, mindfulness really improves the health, the physical health. Uh, for example, if you ask to someone in the 50s to do exercise, uh, for sure, this person would sh- sh- look at you with crazy eyes and what are you mm-hmm. talking about? And today, no one's discuss that it's good for health to do exercise, physical exercise. Um, also today, almost people are convinced that having good uh, and healthy uh, habits with the food are also important. And you will see that in, some, in not much years, uh, mental health training the mind will be also another key aspect for the health, because health is not only uh, depend on the physics, depend on the mind. We are a very complex organism in which all are interconnected. Our emotions uh, produce changes in our, in, in, our, in our body, in our physical body. For example, stress is directly connected with uh, disease like cancer, Alzheimer, cholesterol, heart attacks. There are a lot. Or just gastritis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Then uh, it sounds, it's really very, very important. And I, I, I believe that it's probably it's most important than the others. Because if you are, have a healthy mind, you will guide your body to have healthy habits. And for sure, you will do exercise because your mind clearly knows that you must do it. That's interesting. You are right, Leo, that the, the negative habits do seem to go together, don't we? I mean, when we are suppressing exactly. emotions or thoughts that we don't want to visit, um, maybe we, you know, there's a in situation work-wise or whatever that we just don't want to go there. Well, that's exactly the time we tend to zone out in front of Netflix with a big bag of right. popcorn or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, we disengage, <laughs> we, we escape. Yeah, escape, um, exactly. exactly. And we escape from emotions. I don't want to feel that. I don't want to think that, you know? And we escape from other physical things in life. And they do go together in a kind of a negative, you know, we try to numb these things through, you know, shopping or through eating or through, you know, other, you know, not necessarily productive habits. Um, and so Leo's absolutely right about all of those things. Uh, that's interesting. So really self-awareness can, can really take us a long way, even with mental health and, and us feeling as feeling present in today, uh, today's life and not dwelling, as you said, either on the past or thinking about the future. And, uh, um, yeah, we talked about, yeah, maybe a little bit of conflict and stress a lot. So how can we, uh, how can organizations skillfully meld the, yeah, the operational excellence and also this emotional intelligence now to motivate and inspire. Leo, do you want to start or do you want me to go first on this one? I, I, will, I will do a, a very brief introduction. Uh, leadership is, is fundamental. Um, you know, when in, in big companies as our, um, the changes when start from the bottom to the top are very, very slow. It's possible for sure. There are a lot of small initiatives that go and spread in the company. For example, I, I am part of the uh, self-organized uh, team called Mindfulness Pioneers. You could find our, our group in Jump page looking for mindfulness, you will find. Uh, and we are offering a lot of uh, activities, yoga, meditation, um, there are a lot of offers uh, of, of 
co-workers of our company that uh, really are giving that, that uh, offering because they believe in that. They, they want to share. I want to share. Uh, but they is, uh, goes very slowly. A person to person, voice to voice. When the, the leadership is involved, the changes are faster. And I think this is a key point. Change the leadership mentality. And I am sure that Matthew have more things to say about uh, that. <laughs> uh, specifically, I mean, he's right. And when we talk about operational excellence, um, it's really a, a, a question of leadership. Um, it's a question of culture. And how do you motivate and inspire? While the link to emotional intelligence isn't direct, except when we think that in that relationship management, the importance of inspiration and influence, what I find when it comes to operational excellence is in many, many companies I've worked with, um, they really don't know how to inspire or craft a vision around operational excellence that will in any way positively influence the emotions. Mm. Because for, you know, regardless, and I'm going to be cynical here, most leaders, when they talk about operational excellence, they mean cost reduction. Numbers. Numbers, cost reduction. And in, when I work with many of the teams in Magenta, which are the service organizations there, they even call it in headcount reduction. <laughs> Do you understand? Okay. That's how they measure it. That's how yeah. they measure it. So it's pretty hard then to inspire people around it. So I would point back to the origins, which, of course, all of the best practices in these areas come from um, Toyota. And there, the, 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 the idea of operational excellence is not cost reduction, it's waste reduction. And we live in societies now which are very focused on reducing waste. This is some, we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about the environment. And so there are many, many opportunities to positively touch the, not to mention simply the desire to improve. One of the most important things from a point of empathy is to look at your people and see everyone likes to master and get better at things. And we can tap into that because, you know, underneath operational excellence is always continuous improvement. That's the driving energy, looking for ways to reduce this waste, right? Um, and, you know, this was my main area of focus and change for, for several years. It was lean transformations and things like this. And this is really how you build that culture. It's not about the tools and techniques. It's about this desire to continually get better and to remove this unnecessary waste within our systems and process, just like a sports team tries to get better and better. And Understanding what really drives humans, what really drives us, what really gets us motivated does require empathy, but not even that much. I mean, if you were to ask yourself, when you have a really great day, what made it a great day during work? You know, some days you come out feeling exhausted and others you have ridiculously crazy full days and you're energized. Mm. If you were to analyze and say, what makes a great day? I guarantee it's the same for most of the other workers in the company and leaders can do this. And a few of those are sense of purpose, a chance to get better and, you know, doing things that getting better at things that matter uh, and receiving a sense of pride and recognition for doing the quality work. You know, it's not that hard, um, but empathy and understanding that your people need these things and giving them an opportunity to experience them. They're not giving them. You don't need to give them this stuff. You need to create the environment where they can experience. Going back again, exactly. if you want continuous improvement, you need psychological safety to get all those ideas. So, hmm. And again, that psychological safety requires an environment or a culture where we are allowed to stretch, risk, and even fail. Exactly. Totally agree, Matthew. 
So it goes back again to to the say right right uh, psychological safety and kind of sense of belonging, feeling like the um, yeah the mindset about uh, the work and and the, the the making this work life balance doesn't make sense anymore because it's it's uh, hypocritical to say mm. yeah there's work and there's life when you spend so much time at work that it, it doesn't make sense that you you make a separation between your life and work it re- has to be really <laughs> both together and you have to be mindful that. When you're working, you're working as a human, not a mm. robot. So <laughs> things still, you know, it still Absolutely, <laughs> mate. count, right? Well, actually, we, we, we try to do these fanciful dividers. It's not just work life and family life and home life and social life and romance. It's just life. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and the skills are pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, the technical knowledge is different, yeah. but the soft skills part, the emotional management, you know, influencing you, you have to influence in work. You have to influence in home. You have to influence in the dating world. You know, it's, it's, they're just life skills. <laughs> totally. And you're right. It is a little bit ridiculous to, I mean, it, the discussion work-life balance is, is, I mean, is it really, are we really talking about the right things? Uh, we need to find ways to, to make sure our people are not overly stressed um, around these things. And it gets harder now. As you know, because we're mm-hmm. doing it at a distance or we're doing it at hybrid. So all this psychological safety has to be created online sometimes. And mm-hmm. this is really a challenge. Yeah. Yes, uh, a new challenge. Yeah. There was something I, I came to my mind mm-hmm. when, when you mentioned we are humans, no robots. Um, some years ago, uh, I had to take the decision if I start uh, studying more about um, artificial intelligence <laughs> or emotional intelligence. And, and I, in this moment, I think I, I passed the last 20 years almost, uh, teaching machines to work as a humans because I, I work in, in process automation. Uh, but now I want to teach humans to be more humans. I thought you were going to say, I want to teach humans to work like machines. I was like, wait a minute, no. Leo, that doesn't follow from everything. I figured that you were going to change that ending. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah, yeah because this is that uh, it seems to be the motto of the company the last year. You must work as a machine. You must work more and more. Is, and no, you are human. You have emotions. And this is your power because all that could be automatic, a machine could do it for you better. Mm. This is not your strength. Your strength is to be human. Your strength is to have emotions. This is your strength. Then focus there. And from there, you will be more powerful, a best, a best performance. You will be more happy at the end because you will feel that your work is more motivated. Huh? You know, Leo, you just brought something very important to my mind. You, you mentioned the, the role that leaders need to play in, in showing the importance of these things uh, within the companies to role model that the importance of emotional intelligence and mindfulness. I would add something to that you just reminded me of. Because any job, that is basically can be replaced, that is, you know, repetitive operational tasks that can be replaced or automated will be. And so it is kind of up to our leaders, since we know that we will be automating so much of this work, which means through that automation, we'll be losing jobs for those people who have not developed themselves further than this. It's almost a moral obligation as our leaders, to help our people develop this resilience, this humility and an openness that comes with self-awareness and emotional intelligence to begin to expand out because we do need our people growing and learning so that they can, let's say, utilize the best part of what it means to be human that cannot be automated for their own protection. Do you understand? And I think it's really up to our companies. We must be because we know it's our, it's an economic imperative that we automate what we can. So we have the moral obligation to be developing the people 
whose jobs would be affected by that, whether it's five years from now or 10 years from now. Yeah, that's a, that's a really vital, important point that you mentioned that because we, yeah, we're talking about artificial intelligence and the moment you bring up this topic, people feel stressed already and mm-hmm. feel that, okay, we're talking about uh, the, the jobs that are going to be existing and the mental strain on employees that they have to figure out something else and they have to do it on their own because we still tell people you have to do it on your own and, you know, <laughs> you have to figure out what you can do. So maybe it's important to, yeah, what you said, to remind leaders that it is moral obligation to you as well to make sure that your employees figure out how they can live and survive in the future with their emotions. And because we're humans after all. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Um, and you also mentioned, as you, Leo, you mentioned that um, we're changing, right? What we, uh, what we had in, fif- in the 50s uh, is not available now and is not the same now. So what do you see as other areas and potential areas for emotional intelligence in corporate environments to, to, to improve or exist? I think the first is to include this topic in the conversation to give more visibility uh, to the emotional intelligence topic in the companies. Um, and we are trying to, to create some groups for meditation, for sharing emotions. Uh, and it's something that is starting right now, but with the time more and more people are in. For example, uh, when we do the training in Search Inside Yourself, the, 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 the training was uh, done by uh, the Institute in partnership with SIP. Uh-huh. SIP right now, did a big rollout of the, a huge rollout of the program. Today, there are almost uh, a thousand of employees of SAP that did the program. And they had almost 50 certified teachers in the organization. Then, um, and they are doing a lot of um, statistics about the results. Uh, and they found that almost it has an a, a improvement of 10% in the stress reduction and also some similar values in the in well-being and connection with others and working in, in teams. Then there are really uh, real measures about that this works. Um, and we are trying to do the same here in, in Deutsche Telekom. We are starting right now. Uh, and let's see, I see, I really believe that in two or three years, we will see something similar in our company that in SAP, because we are a very good masters that are guiding us in this process. And then I, I really, I really think that we will see it's, it's, it's not something in the far future. It's something in the near future in which more and more people will be aware of that. And then I think it's a, like a, a atomic reaction. No? Mm. Start with two or three, but then the spread, the word is expressed faster and faster. Then I think things are happening right now. Uh, probably COVID uh, was uh, a factor that uh, helped in some manner to start with this awareness. Uh, and it's funny to say that today because I with, with COVID right now, <laughs> but, um, for a less in my, it's my, in my experience, when the pandemic start, I feel a call to help. I know, I, I know today that this, uh, learning of these skills really helps, really helps, helps me to survive, I mean, in these years, these crazy years. And it's helping a lot of people around the world to, to be more healthy, to be bad uh, emotional state, in better emotional state. And also to continue working with motivation without losing uh, our motivation in the daily life. That's great. I was going to ask you, um, how did emotional intelligence help you? But (laughs) 
you kind of already answered my question. Um, yeah, I wanted to, the next question would be about how it helped you not only in your yeah work life, but in your day to day life. Um, is there something that you can share with us that was really for you like, uh, wow, this is really the work of emotional intelligence? Hmm. You know, it, it, I, I hate to give, uh, how do I want to put this? Um, I mean, because it's a little embarrassing. Um, I, <laughs> it's okay. It's a safe space. I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can look back on behaviors I've done, you know, and it, some of them are not so long ago either, to be honest, because it's a constant practice. But I look right. down, I look back at the, the, what were obvious manifestations of insecurity. Um, in early career or in relationships, um, especially when you know you enter a new group, and I've moved around the world a lot, um, or arrogant, you know, examples of arrogance, which was a cover up. And I think the greatest thing was, as you mentioned earlier, this authentic, to beginning to develop humility as a, as a partner of confidence. Do you understand what I mean? Hmm. That came with the awareness of emotions and, and seeing how they drive you and not trying to hide from them or to cover them up through, you know, false pride or arrogance or trying to be better than someone else, you know. And it allows for just being at ease. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, for example, meeting the two of you and wanting the best for you, you know, wanting you know, because you're not feeling competitive in competition and threatened all the time. You know, when you learned, yes, this fear, this desire to get ahead, this desire to, uh, to prove, because I think that so many of us, and it was definitely true for me, are desperate to prove to the world and to ourselves, we're okay, we're good enough. Yeah. And to finally let that grasping, release a little bit allows for you know to flow more with what the situation is at the moment to see the emotions and let them go and say that's fine that's normal i'm still going to do what i need to do yeah i'm afraid mm -hmm. and being authentically able to care without worrying about you know what am i going to get in return <laughs> you right. know to just purely <laughs> like people as people yeah. and not to see the world as a tool or I know that's a lot to throw at you, but it is all linked to that first step of knowing how fear, anger, and these emotions are driving the behaviors and how you get comfortable with those emotions. It has a massive quality of life increase. And the second point is, you know, I think you can imagine the difference, the quality of your life of chewing on something and being angry or frustrated for hours as we can do. Or for mere moments. Right, yeah. And that is a, you know, can you imagine the quality of life change? Yeah. And that comes with this training. That's right. what it comes with. So that's my long answer and a little bit convoluted. I apologize. You didn't give us anything embarrassing. I was waiting for you embarrassing. <laughs> no, I was, I didn't give you examples of those behaviors, but there are, and I think for any of us, there are plenty of, and I don't, I'm not beating myself up about them. But exactly. I wish I had known. Do you know what I mean? I wish someone had taught me these things. I wish I had been trained as a teenager that my anxiety was normal and I didn't have, you know, that, where do you think the bullying comes from? Right. Mm. It's the insecurity. And, and you see kids do it all the time when we act like it's, mm. it is a cultural thing, one, but it is simply a natural human reaction to insecurity and fear. And if we don't train them to deal with that insecurity and fear, you can expect these behaviors. And I wish someone had trained me. I wish I had met this earlier. Just as I'm sure Leo would say he had wished before all of that stress and years of searching, he had met it. Yeah. I, I cannot agree more with you, Matthew. Fully, fully agree. Uh, and th this is the same history of my life. It's, it's exactly the same. Um, I was fighting for years with um, my colleagues to try to demonstrate that I am right. Mm. And, and this fight uh, goes to nowhere. The same in my relationships uh, with my couples and my um, 
the same with friends. Uh, these fights don't go anywhere. When you release this tension and you are aware why you are doing so, why you do not listen to the other. Probably the older has the reason in this point. Unless if you want to demonstrate that you are right, first you must demonstrate that you could listen. Mm. This is the best example you could say, give to others. And I agree also with Matthew this, why no one teach me that when I was a kid? And this for me is the next level in this emotional intelligence journey, teaching in the schools. And there are, I, I saw several um, uh, documentaries that uh, there are uh, schools in USA that they are uh, starting doing so. And it's amazing. It's amazing when you uh, teach to kids to emotional intelligence, to teach to kids, for example, to do mindful breathing, uh, to relax. Uh, the problems of um, uh, disappear mm -hmm. or unless are minimized because um, most of the problems in the, in, when you are a kid, when you are, when you are young, when you are a teenager are, as Matthew said, because um, insecurity. Then I kick the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, this is the way we, we, we act when we are not intelligent emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I, for this, I really uh, agree with Matthew. And, and it's something that is, for me, uh, must be a part of the education from the beginning. Because no one teach us that. Probably uh, in the old times when we live in trips, uh, all together, small group of people, all together, we learn because we, we see how the adults interact. But today uh, uh, in the schools, we uh, learn about math, about science, about, about books of history, about literature. But we do not learn, learn how, to how to manage our emotions. <laughs> and, Leo, and at home, our fathers um, are the same as us. That's true. Has the same problems, has, has the same lack of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Then uh, nobody teach these skills to us in the in the when, when kids. Uh, schools aren't great for, I mean, Ed, as has been said, Leo, the only time students in school work together as teams, which is critical in the future, is when they're cheating together. You right. Know? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Only on you the know, bad behaviors mm -hmm. you get together and you actually uh, uh, collaborate and find the fun to work with others when you're a kid. <laughs> <laughs> For so the parents who might be listening here, um, who are wondering, there are a lot of resources out there now. You can find um, for teaching mindfulness and things to children. But I, t I will give you one. Um, I don't mean to be pitching for something outside of this group, but um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Stillwater. Uh, Stillwater is mm -hmm. a panda bear. Um, you can see it. It was originally a, a, a series of books, and now there is a series on Apple Plus, mm -hmm. you know, the streaming service. And Stillwater is a panda who has some small kids as his neighbors. And it is the, the best lessons in emotional intelligence I've ever seen. Um, I watch it with my 10-year-old and even my 14-year-old, even though it's written for, I think, a little bit smaller kids. And it gives us a foundation to discuss these things. And it is so wisely taught. Leo, I don't know if you've ever seen the Stillwater series. No, but I take note. Yeah, I mean, but, yeah. if you want to have good discussions about these things with kids, um, really mm. strongly recommend it. Um, use the free version to watch all of them within one week or something like that, you know, <laughs> if you don't binge want watch. a whole long binge watch Stillwater. It's, it's very, very good. And I think it's very important that we have these conversations with our kids and that we become fluent in the language of emotional intelligence. Um, that's a, I think, that's good. like Leo says, it's critically important for our future. Yeah. And, and the first always is start with ourselves. Because as we uh, were discussing at the beginning, the basic for 
uh, uh, connecting with others is self-awareness. Then all start with us. If us as a fathers are not connecting with our emotions, how can we teach emotional intelligence to our kids? It's like in the in the airplane when when the oxygen mask uh, mm -hmm. go out. First, put yourself <laughs> the mask. So then you can help others. And then you could exactly exactly. Yeah, that's a good that's, example. That's the point. That's a good example. And. Uh, is there another any book that you can recommend for yeah working adults that's really helped you? I think Matthew you mentioned one of the one of the most famous books. Yeah, that was the Dan Goldman's Emotional Intelligence. But for your leaders, I would say also look at the book by Goldman and Boyatzis and Annie McGee, which is Primal Leadership. And then of course there is the book Search Inside Yourself, which is the <laughs> on which the program <laughs> that you guys are offering is is based. Uh, which is a really good introduction to both the emotional intelligence element because it takes yeah. from Goleman's concepts um, exactly. and then applies, you know, the mindfulness concepts at the same time. So I would recommend very strongly those. And is there any? No, I think that's a good start. I'll just okay. leave it there. Great. Leo, yeah, any, fully, any recommendations? Yeah, I agree with Matthew. I, I agree with Matthew. For example, I um, search inside yourself. Uh, for example, was written by a techie guy like me. Well, <laughs> the <laughs> then you know. uh, it's something that is very easy to read for people that are not in the topic. Then uh, it's, it's, I think it's uh, for people like me that comes from from technology. Uh, it's a very good choice for for a start. And for sure, if you like the book, uh, probably join the <laughs> if you're program. part of our company, <laughs> you will you, you could join the, the program. Uh, you could find information about the program in the jump page. Uh, you, you search first mindfulness. Then this is the base page for of mindfulness pioneers. And inside the, the page, you will find information about the program. Super. Then and you will find a lot of offering in in, di in different languages. Most is in German, but there are also things in in English. Super for for all people. Great, that's for for our colleagues working in the Magenta world. And uh, for you, Matthew, where can people go to learn more about you and any of the work that you're involved with? Well, you can find me, of course, on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just Matthew Strauss, S-T-R-A-U-S-S, -S, and it's the one who's in Vienna, Vienna, Austria. Um, and Argo is very easy. It's argo.at. Um, we're out of Vienna, but of course, I end up working globally, um, not only with Virtual Magenta world. globally, <laughs> but, you know, traveling all over with, with other customers from the, around the world. Um, yeah, you can find me there. I don't have, I mean, any articles I... Uh, occasionally put something up on LinkedIn, but I let my my blog go. So there's no blog you can check me on right now, but there'll be something in the future, I'm sure, Super. coming out that it find a better way. Super. Thanks. Well, I think we reached the end of our conversation today. This has been really delightful. And um, thank you so much, Leo and Matthew, because you're sick, you got COVID and you're still here with me. I really appreciate so much the time uh, you're sharing with me today and also your really nice experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, both of you. It was a really nice conversation. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you as you well. You really are an inspiring person. <laughs> Thank you. Same, same to both of you. Thank you and all the best. So that's all, folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in to the TSE Talks and joining me along with my guests. All in all, emotional intelligence is not only fundamental for the success of organizations, but also for our own well-being. Matthew and Leo have strikingly different paths that led them to learn this skill. Nevertheless, they are living example of how managing emotions can make your life more pleasant and stress-free. So I strongly recommend you to check out the Search Inside Yourself training, the books and the series our guests mentioned. And you? How did emotional intelligence help you with your work and personal life? Share with us your thoughts and let's meet again on our next topic. Stay tuned!